I'm glad I can be with you again to cover a very important subject that is taught in the Bible that many Christians have not perhaps seen. And we're going to go mostly to the book of Revelation, but we're going to cover Old and New Testament. And uh, our subject uh, for this series, uh, for this uh, presentation in this series is set free by the truth. Where can we find truth today? But before we begin, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. That his prayer in John 17 was that uh, we would be sanctified by thy word and thy word is truth. And so Lord, I just pray that uh, you'll bless me as I speak on where to find truth, which is the true church in these last days, when there are so many conflicting voices and so many denominations and so many different faiths. I pray for each viewer that you'll bless them to receive your word and your spirit may speak to each heart, including mine, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. It has been said that each one of us is born with a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts, in our minds. And it seems with an inexpressible craving that, that everyone that is born on planet Earth subconsciously is seeking something but cannot describe it. And yet we know we want it, we need it. And so man in his restlessness tries to fill that void, that vacuum with entertainment and amusement, extramarital affairs or fornication, pornography, uh, trying to get a deeper understanding and going through psychics and fortune tellers and some go to alcohol, some go into drugs and leisure time activities, some get focused on making money and business and fashion, uh, trying to fill this void uh, and yet with no lasting satisfaction. In fact, um, uh, it was um, the founder of the Rolling Stones that said, he actually penned a song, I can get no satisfaction. And it's true, this world can never satisfy the deep longing desires of our heart that God has placed there that he alone can occupy. So sooner or later, the chances are that you might be resting in your bed and before you go to sleep, thoughts go through your mind. Well, you know, is it possible that I can find peace in my heart? Is it possible I can find God, the true God, the living God? And the question might even be, an echo from the past. And so the book of Isaiah tells us this in Isaiah 55 verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? In fact, Jesus goes on to say in Luke 12 and verses 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. No, no. In fact, uh, some of the richest men and some of the most talented musicians or film stars Many of them lead lonely lives and will tell you, money does not buy you peace, fulfillment, and security. Only God can do that, friends. And so people today are becoming weary of chasing elusive rainbows. And there seems to be a sense that there is a power outside of them that they need to uh, tap into. And so sadly, many go to the wrong sources. And this is nothing new. Because ever since sin entered into this world, our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, experienced this strange emptiness that comes in disobedience. This strange emptiness when we are not connected in harmony, in unity with God. And so only God can restore and fill that vacuum. In fact, God allowed the children of Israel to wander in the desert after he had delivered them by ten powerful miracles from Egypt, from the mightiest nation then. And when they had left uh, Egypt and crossed over the Red Sea miraculously, 
God allowed them to become wanderers in the desert and even to become hungry and thirsty for one purpose, that they would recognize their need of Him and that He alone supplies all needs. And so in the book Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, Moses writes, So He humbled you, speaking of the children of Israel, allowed you to hunger, that you might that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In fact, Jesus quoted those very words in Matthew 4 verse 4, quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, what we have just looked at right now. And of course, he identified himself as the bread of life, that if a man will taste and eat, he will never hunger. In other words, he will never uh, hunger for the things of this world that cannot satisfy. He will have the satisfaction and peace and grace and beauty of the holiness of God in him that, friends, you can never get enough of, but you know you've got what you need. So evidently, God does allow mankind, even today in this postmodern world, in the 21st century, God does allow people to sometimes go into places where they have nothing else but to look up outside of themselves. And so we see today, even today, people are looking for God in different religions. And there is a tremendous emphasis today, particularly in the Christian church, on ecumenism and a push to break down denominational walls. And there's much study concerning which is uh, the true religion. Um, and culture, of course, has come in and people think in culture they will find satisfaction. No, no, no. In fact, in the Christian church, many new churches are rapidly springing up all over the world. Uh, in fact, there's uh, about 30,000 plus different churches and denominations, each one of them seeming to have aspects of truth, each one claiming to have a special message of guidance for people on the earth. But is that God's will that there's all these different schisms and divisions in the Christian church? No, 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 friends. So we want to look from the Word of God, from the Bible today, because whilst each denomination claims to have the truths of God's word and their beliefs and tenets seem to uh, indicate so, we find that many of the teachings are divergent and different from the word of God. And so can we today find which is the true church? Perhaps you, a dear viewer, are wondering or the thought has come to you in the past, recently, over now, how can I know which is the true church in the world today. Does God have a special group? Does he have a remnant church that is identified in his word? And the answer is an emphatic yes. So I want you to go with me in our study. We're going to begin in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4. It says there's one body and one spirit just as you are called in one hope of your calling. So clearly there it says there's one body, one spirit. It goes on to say in verses 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, verse 6. And so, how, dear friend, can we discover that one true faith? How can we discover that one way? Jesus says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, evidently, we will have to find it in the Christian church, but with all the different divergent groups and denominations, how can we know which is the truth? 1 Timothy 3 verses 15, it says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God and the pillar and ground of truth. So the church is God's repository where His grace is manifested. The church is that one supreme object that He loves that he has put in this world to lead men and women to know him, the true God, the one Lord, and the one who alone can save us. So that's quite a statement, wouldn't you agree? And perhaps, friends, God has brought you to this study so that you may understand how you can discover which is the true church in a world that is so filled of confusion even in the Christian church. 
Well, according to scripture, Jesus never intended that there could be any confusion and any friend's uh, way of bringing about disappointment uh, in terms of our search for truth. In fact, in John 17 verses 21, this was the prayer of Jesus just before the cross. And he says that they, speaking of the Christian church, speaking of all the disciples, of course, he was talking the disciples with him there, but this applies to every Christian today. It says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And so clearly, Jesus wants his church to be united on the platform of truth, on his foundation on his church. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 25 says that there should be no schism or no division in the body. And so Paul, that great scholar that wrote most of the New Testament, uh, I love the writings of Paul, uh, he predicted that apostasy would come and with it division. Acts chapter 20 and verses 28 it says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock to the shepherd, the church of God. For I know this, that after my departure, he's speaking of his death, and after the death of the last apostles, the disciples of Jesus, he predicted that savage wolves will come in among you. That's the Christian church, not sparing the flock. Also from among you, men will arise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. That's a sad situation and state of affairs in the Christian church today. Many um, a would-be preacher uh, picks up his Bible, uh, opens up a church, uh, preaches the word, and then next thing, he diverts all the attention to himself and off from the love of Christ and of his word. And many have led others astray. Many will take the tithes and offerings which are holy and use it for themselves. And so there is so much of this perversion in the Christian church where men and women who have extraordinary gifts of uh, eloquence and oratory, men who have some money and wealth and information and they go on television and as soon as the money starts rolling in, they spend it all upon themselves. This was not the Christian church that Jesus started, friends, all the means came in for the gospel and there was enough to sustain the apostles. And so I want to ask you the question, as we look at the pages of history of the Christian church, we discover what Paul predicted is exactly what happened. Ravage wolves, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing came in the Christian church. False teachers arose and um, they had some truths, but evidently, they had many truths that were not of the word of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he says to him that uh, you must be aware of false teachers and those who will come in the last days that will deny the power of God. They will have godliness, but they will deny the power of God. He says, from such, turn away. And he actually mentions some like Hamanias and Philetus, who he said, uh, preaching the truth, have erred, have erred from the scriptures, uh, claiming that the resurrection has already, um, uh, claiming that the second coming has already taken place. And so uh, that, hap that happens, friends, even today. And so we find here that God has a message today. And just as there are many ways to be able to uh, build a house or build a business, but there's only one correct way to do it. There is only one way that we can understand God's true church. In fact, you know, um, each country that prints their own uh, notes, bank notes, um, they have experts who know what is the true and genuine note, what its features are, its stain marks and uh, all the different designs and features on it uh, because there are many counterfeits that are in the world today. And so they don't go and look at all the different counterfeits and say, well, that's a counterfeit, that's a counterfeit, that's a counterfeit because there's so many different counterfeits. No, they study the true features and all the identifying marks 
security features on the banknote, and because they know that so well, they can easily spot a fake and show uh, which is the genuine against the fake. So as we look in the Christian church today, there are many counterfeits I want to say, but we don't have to study the teachings and denominations of every single religion. It will take more than a lifetime, friends. I want to tell you the surest and safest way we can discover truth. That is to go to the Bible, not to what a man teaches, not what a man says. And we can go to God for ourselves and discover what is truth. And so in the book of Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. And so, of course, it was prophets that wrote the Bible. Uh, men of God that were moved by the Holy Spirit and penned all that is in the canon today. So I want to take the book of Revelation because in the book of Revelation, that particular book and also Daniel, it's a twin book, uh, we find uh, there God has given us enough information for discovering who is the true church, who are the remnant, who are the people that make up this last day church. It predicts a conflict between Christ's church and that of Satan, between Babylon and between God's true keeping church. And so Revelation 12 verse 1 says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, it says in verse 2, being with child travailing in birth and pain to deliver. And so clearly here is a picture of God's true church. Revelation chapter 12 uh, speaks of a woman clothed with sun. Of course, a woman in Bible prophecy means a church. Paul says, I have espoused you unto Christ, that I have espoused you unto Christ, that you might be as a chaste virgin. And so here is a symbol, a woman, a pure woman, a virtuous woman is a symbol of a pure church. And of course, an adulterous woman uh, is that of the apostate church. Of Babylon and we find that in Revelation chapter 17. Nonetheless we are looking at this woman that's clothed the sun. It, it represents the righteousness of God and she's uh, travailing uh, in, in birth with pain. She has the moon under the feet. In other words uh, that's uh, the moon reflects friends the sun right and so the Old Testament reflects the New Testament. The Old Testament is the, is the truth reconciled and the New Testament is the truth revealed because here is this woman, she is transitioning from the old to the new because she has a crown of stars on her head. And that of course symbolizes the kingdom number, the apostles that Jesus gave the power and authority to preach the kingdom of God. And so here she is crying to be delivered. Of course, this is when Jesus was to be born. And um, of course, Jesus comes forth with power and authority. Jeremiah 6 verse 2 says, I've likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And Isaiah 51 verse 16 says, Say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, For I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so as John sees this woman in Revelation chapter 12, that is clothed the sun with the moon under feet, he sees the emergence, the beginning of the Christian church. She's uh, crying to be delivered, of course, when Jesus is born. He begins his ministry in the year AD 27 and begins to proclaim the gospel saying right there that the time is fulfilled and he begins to proclaim the gospel, the time of Daniel when he would be anointed at his baptism. And so we find in Revelation 13 now, uh, Revelation chapter 12 rather, is a picture of an apostate church symbolized by a woman that is adulterous. Revelation 17 verse 3 says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. 
And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. It says on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So here's a different type of woman. First of all, we see she's sitting on a scarlet beast. And so a beast in Bible prophecy is that which is a kingdom. And so it could be a political power. So here is a church united to a state. And we find that instead of having the simple beauty that God gives to her, she has adornments of gold and uh, precious stones. She doesn't have the true beauty of an inward virtuous character. We find that on her head, she has inscripted mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So she has daughters, she has children that have drank from a cup of abominations. We find the abominations represent her false teachings. And so this is an apostate church. And she has great power apparently to sway kings and nations. And that cup, what is in that cup? But the wine of false teachings that God created the world by evolution and not by creation. The false teachings that God's law has been nailed the cross, that the Sabbath was changed from the seventh day that God sanctified and made holy the first day. She teaches that you can have forgiveness from a man by confession to a man instead of going straight to Jesus who alone is our advocate and intercessor. She teaches traditions. She teaches holy days and precepts that are not sanctioned by the word of God and so this uh, this power is the one that we see in the last days Babylon that will go against the true worshippers God's commandment keeping church James chapter 4 verse 4 says adulterers and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God and so clearly a pure woman represents a pure church and an apostate woman a false woman represents a false church. Going on, Revelation 12 verse 2, speaking about the pure woman now, the true church. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And the dragon, who's the dragon? This is the devil, stood before the woman, the true church, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her and her child as soon as it was born. Is that not what the devil tried to do through the pagan Roman system? Through Herod the Great who tried to destroy baby Jesus when he was born and because the wise men did not reveal where he was born he went to Bethlehem and destroyed all the children beginning from three and under. What a terrible wicked system trying to destroy the man child in fact in revelation 12 or 17 it speaks of a war that broke out in heaven that might surprise some of you how can a war break up in heaven this is not a war with weapons this is not a war of masculinity this is a war of ideas this is a war against god's law this is a war against god himself and his character it says war broken in heaven michael that's another name for jesus his pre-incarnate name and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought so here is a battle in heaven evidently this was before the earth was made and created because we find already this dragon, this serpent, the devil came to the man and the woman and deceived them. So this is before creation. We don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us when, but this war happened before creation. It says, the dragon and his angels fought, but, verses 8, they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them from heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan 
who deceives the whole world. So you see, he's mentioned as a serpent because he uses the medium of a serpent in the Garden of Eden to deceive Eve, and through Eve deceived Adam. And through their fall into sin, the whole world was deceived because they could only give birth. Eve could only produce Adam and Eve, sinners. Their posterity, their children were born into a sinful world. And so the Bible says he lost that war in heaven and he was cast out, verse 9, to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12 verse 5 says, speaking about this pure woman, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and a child was caught up to God and to his throne. When Jesus overcame the devil at the cross, he said these words in John 19 verse 30, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You see, the devil's kingdom was finished. And yes, time would have to play out before it would be finally destroyed. And we find that takes place after the millennium, the thousand years recorded in the book of Revelation chapter 21, which is still future because we're still in a world where the devil seems to have sway, where the devil seems to have his own way. But friends, behind that, God is the almighty, powerful, ruling God. He is the one that is able to guide you and me through all that the devil is trying to do to destroy us. And so evidently, Jesus on the cross had obtained full victory because he says in the book of Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through to 20, this is last word of the disciples, he says, All power and authority has been given unto me under heaven and earth. And he says to them, Go ye therefore and make disciples of every nation, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we know that it's a great commission. So Jesus has all power and authority after the cross. And so after his ascension into heaven, that's when Jesus was caught up the, the child, the woman was caught up into heaven to God and his throne. We find then that the devil, he recognized that he couldn't beat Jesus at the cross. So he goes after his remnant church, the followers of Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice in Revelation 19 verses 15 says, Out of his mouth, that's the mouth of Jesus Christ. This is symbolic now. Speaking of the word of God goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. Finally, all kingdoms will come to an end as prophesied in Daniel chapter 2. The stone that struck the image in the feet of iron and clay is coming. That stone is Jesus. The stone is symbolic of the coming of Christ. He said of himself that he is the rock, the rock of ages. And if you will fall upon him, that rock, he will have you. He will keep you. But if the rock falls on you, symbolizing the wicked, then it will crush them and grind them to powder, just as the stone in the image of Daniel chapter 2 did. And so in Ephesians 1 verse 20, it says here that God the Father raised him from the dead, speaking of Jesus, and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places. And so friends, that war that began in heaven, that moved to this earth, Jesus obtained victory on the cross. Herod tried to destroy him. He failed. The devil tried through the pagan Roman system and through the apostate, uh, Judaism, uh, the, the apostate church of Judaism, through the scribes and the Pharisees, through uh, Caiaphas and those that put him on the cross and nailed him the tree. He tried. The devil tried to destroy Jesus. But of course, Jesus said, you destroy this temple, speaking of his body, he says, and I will raise it up in three days. And a sure Sunday morning, Jesus came forth victorious. You see, the devil dogged Jesus all his life and even at the cross, but he failed to block God's plan to save you and I. And so as Christ's body hang on the, hung on the cross, what looked like defeat to the disciples, and they were disappointed was actually the death knell that removed Satan from the position that he had usurped to be the prince of this world. And so an empty tomb was Satan's waterloo. 
because Jesus rose again. And as Jesus rode and ascended to the throne, the prophecy was on schedule just as God predicted the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel 9 verse 27, that in the midst of the remaining week, the last seven years that are to be for Daniel and his people, that Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, he would be crucified. It says he would be cut off, but not for himself, but for his people. How wonderful that prophecy was right on time, that Jesus died in AD 31. And so, friends, just as Jesus predicted that he would rise again and he would go to the Father and to intercede there for us today, he's just as real as he said. So failing from his attempt to destroy God's son at the cross, Satan turned his wrath upon the woman and all of the disciples, all but one, John who writes the last book of the Bible, Revelation, all of them died a martyr's death. And even John, it was Diocletian that tried to destroy him by putting him into a cauldron of boiling oil, but God saved John. And then he says, okay, well, we can't kill this guy. Let's put him on the island of Patmos. Let's get him away from the people. And there on the island of Patmos, John says in Revelation chapter 1, that he had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the Sabbath, the Lord's day. And there Jesus comes to give John personally a message from heaven of his love for John and a love for the church. And through the message to the seven churches, God sends a message through angels to guide the church in these last days. And so the Apostle Paul, who was one of the mightiest converts to the Christian church, he writes in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verses 5 onwards. He says to Timothy, I know that the time of my departure, speaking of his death, is at hand. And um, he says to Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have run the race, the race of life. And then he says these wonderful words. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he says these beautiful words for you and me. But not for me only, but also unto them that love the appearing of the Lord. So God has promised that for us. And even though the Apostle Paul was beheaded, I've been to Rome where they incarcerated and put him in the prison. I've been to the place where they claim he was executed. I've been to the place where they have raised up a church. Sadly, that church doesn't preach what Paul taught. And so we find here in this book here, Ecclesiastical Research, something takes place in the second century. Something takes place. In page 51, toward the latter end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. The first, the first simplicity disappeared as the old disciples retired to their graves. Wow. As the disciples are about to pass on, we find already the devil is bringing about a false system of worship. And so we find there a man by the name of Constantine, he was a pagan in heart, but he claimed to have converted to Christianity. And we studied this the other day, the year AD 321, 7th of March, he makes a decree and he puts it in writing and he tells the whole of the Roman Empire that people are to keep Sunday as a holiday and then later on, the Church of Rome in AD 325 declared it to be a holy day. And so Christianity lost its true and pure faith. And many of the pagans that came into the church, beginning with Constantine and many others, brought with them the superstitious beliefs of the pagan religion whilst claiming to be true Christians. And by that, they eroded the truths in God's word. From another book, Centuries of Christianity, a concise history, page 58, I'm reading. The new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of the organized Christianity to the point of impotence. 
So the church lost its power as it accepted pagan beliefs and systems without friends, making sure that those converts to the Christian faith had accepted the truths in God's word. So we find during this time, although many Christians remained loyal and faithful to God's truths and protested the changes that were creeping in the Christian church and refused to compromise their faith, many of them were persecuted for their stand. Soon, the Roman emperors issued edicts or edicts, making it an crime punishable by death to reject the false practices of the state church. And so the church became a union of the church and the state. And that is what compromises Babylon. The history of the popes, I'm reading here in this book by Archibald Bowers, volume 2, page 334. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked, and many of them were inhumanely massacred. Friends, this is just history. I mean, you just pick up any good history book, Many of them, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, Diabene writes uh, uh, books on what took place during the time of the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. Uh, there's a wonderful book I'd recommend you to read. It's called The Great Controversy. And this author, a woman by the name of Ellen White, she writes from historical sources what took place, how the Christian church became contaminated, polluted by pagan teachings and superstitions and how God moved through the Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther and many of the other reformers like John Wesley, John Calvin and uh, Zwingli and Huss and Jerome and Latimer and uh, Hugh Lottimer. Many of these reformers found and discovered truth in God's word, but it was the, 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 the design of Satan to try and deceive through Babylon, God's people. So Revelation 12 verse 13 says, The dragon persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So the woman fled, verse 6, Revelation chapter 12, into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and that there she should be fed 1,260 days. And so this prophecy we find in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, and we find also in the book of Revelation here, I'm quoting Revelation chapter 12, it also is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13, where the church is persecuted for 1,260 years. In Revelation it's also spoken of 42 months, but those are prophetic months, 42 months, a biblical month was 30 days, 30 times 42 is 1,260 and Daniel speaks of in Daniel chapter 7 as a time, times, and half a time. Uh, but we find here, friends, God preserved his church. And so notice that God tells us this time of 1,260 years, his true church will be persecuted by the Roman state church. We have already discovered that each day in pro Bible prophecy, a prophetic day is equivalent or symbolic of one literal year. When we find that Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and also in the book of Numbers chapter 14, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So the oppression of God's people as predicted in the book of Daniel and, and Revelation was to continue for 1,000 260 literal years beginning in the year A.D. 538 and culminating or ending in 1798. And so history accurately confirms the Bible prophecy. Roman Empire Justinian, he ordered his Roman general by the name of Belisarius to wipe out the three Aryan powers that opposed the church in Rome. The last of these powers was eliminated in the year 538 AD, the Ostrogoths. And so we find here, this was the beginning of this prophecy that would be 1,260 years from the year 538 AD. It says here, the head of the church, the true and effectual corrector of heretics. This is what Justinian claimed, that he was the head of the church. Friends, the Bible has always separated the state or policy or politics rather, from the church and its mission, which is divine. And so Jesus himself 
would say, render unto Caesar the things belong to Caesar and unto God the things that belong to God. Jesus always separated the church and the state or politics. And so Justinian claimed that he was the head of the church, the true and effectual corrector of heretics. And of course, they burned many of them at the stake. They threw them in the dungeons. Many of them were pulled apart by horses going in the opposite direction. Many of them were thrown into the Colosseums and given to wild animals. And Justinian, who claimed to be the corrector of heretics, was showing that he was actually the tool and the power that Satan was using to bring about this 1,260 year prophecy where God's people would be persecuted. But friends, I want to tell you, there were people who were faithful, Christians who continued to cherish God's truths as revealed in His Word. Word of God was more important to them than even their life. And so many of them fled from Europe into the mountains. Uh, there were the groups of the Waldensians in Italy. They fled to the north of Italy to the mountains there, uh, the Alps. And so did those who were in France. They also fled into the south of France, uh, also to the Alps. And many of them in this wilderness were true worshippers of God. The Waldensians lived in Piedmont Valley and the mountains there. The Huguenots who were all over France uh, and in Bohemia and other faithful Christians, uh, they fled to the Alps and there God provided a place of refuge for them. They were hunted down like common criminals. And if they were found, they were slain mercilessly. They were burnt in their caves where they had found refuge. And if they were found anywhere, they were taken and destroyed. In fact, there's a picture there of my wife standing there in Piedmont Valley there, where the Waldensians had a Bible college. And there's a picture there uh, on this rock here where they wrote through winter, summer and rain all the scripts from the Bible and sent and trained young people as missionaries. Three years they spent in training and then uh, one would go with a senior person into the world and lead men and women to the knowledge of the scriptures. There's a picture there in a cave there where one of the places where they met and um, here they preached the word of God. Here they met every Sabbath to praise and worship God in the mountains. And once they were found, uh, they would be burnt. There's a little monument there at the top of the Mount Caluzzo where you can see thousands of them were thrown down and they were dashed on the rocks at the bottom. Not all died immediately. Those who died immediately, it was a merciful death. But those who did not die immediately, they would remain there in agony until they died of their wounds or something like a wild beast came. And so friends, I want to tell you, millions and millions of Christians, uh, an estimation of anywhere between 50 million and 100 million, much more than all the wars combined on this earth, including World War I and II, millions of people lost their lives during this 1,260 years of the Middle Ages. Many of those martyred Christians will come up, all of them, on the first resurrection. And so God's truth finally triumphed through the Reformation. The Bible that had been long chained to the monastery walls and the cathedral pulpits was translated into the language of the common people by men like Martin Luther and Erasmus and Men that had started in different parts of Europe and even in North America where the printing presses began to print the word of God. And we find there in England the truth was championed and that's where the Reformation uh, had a mighty hold as John Wycliffe translated into the English language the Bible that had only been before in Greek and also in the Italian language. And so it says, friends, that thousands and thousands of people, history tells us, many who died, their blood became seed. And so people like Huss and Jerome were burnt at the stake, but as they gave up 
their lives and testified their truth and died as valiant men, not flinching, not afraid to face death, but they would testify and even as Stephen said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. We find, friends, many, many lost their lives. And so with the discovery of America, new freedom and a new refuge was provided for the persecuted churches of Europe. On the shores of a newborn nation, those who had fled from the persecution of Europe and from the pagan Roman church, they found refuge in America. And here, their civil and religious liberty was actually documented in their constitution documents. And so we find that they wanted a state without a king, they had a constitution, Congress, and they wanted a church without a pope. They wanted people to be part of this priesthood of believers that nobody would dictate to them how they should live. And so it was actually France that, commem that commemorated America's freedom by donating to them the Statue of Liberty to the people of the United States. And yet it was that same power of France that actually removed this power, the Roman State Church, in 1798. We find in the beginning of the 1260 years, France recognized the Roman Church. At the end of the 1260 years, it was France through the power of the man that was controlling there, Napoleon. Napoleon sent his General Berthier to destroy and remove the papacy from power. And that was in the year 1798, exactly as the Bible said. And so at the end of the 18th century, when this prophetic time came to an end, God still had a people, though many of them had been persecuted, God still had groups of people, faithful believers that clung to the word of God and the teachings of the Bible. And this prophecy is found here in the book of Revelation 12, verse 17 here. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. So I ask you, how, how do you discover what is a remnant? So if you go to a seamstress or to a tailor, um, when they cut a fabric to make a suit or a dress or some garment, they will have little off cuts and they'll throw them into a box or basket. And these are called remnants. Well, how do you identify the garment by the remnant? Well, because that remnant cloth is exactly as the fabric in the garment. In the garment sorry. So the devil was angry and went to make war with the last day church. And so quickly, I would like to just give you a little bit of a summary here. How do we identify who is this last day church? We want to translate this verse literally. And we would say, well, the devil was angry with the last day church. Satan was furious with God's people and went to make war with them. John describes two characteristics of this last day church. Notice here, what are the two characteristics? First of all, they are those who keep the commandments, all ten of the commandments that are found in God's moral law. And the devil is upset with those who are obedient to God's commandments. So you can find that church, if they are obedient to all of God's ten commandments, that is one of the identifying characteristics. Well, all churches, they claim to keep the commandments, friends. You see, this power, Babylon, claims to be able to have changed God's law, the seventh day Sabbath. And so they refer it to Sunday as being the Sabbath. But does that make it the Sabbath? No, 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 no. The Bible says in Exodus 20 verses 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Not the first day Sunday, but the seventh day Saturday. That is the true Sabbath. So you're looking for a church, friend, who keep all the commandments of God, including the seventh day Sabbath. And then there are those, friends, who will want to know, well, how did image worship creep in the church, friends? It is through Babylon, friends. God says that we are not to give our allegiance through 
images. And so this power, this Roman state church, they removed the second commandment, which says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. You will not bow down to them, nor worship them. And so some people say, well, we're not bowing down, we're not worshiping them. But the Bible says, don't make them. Don't bring them into the church, because many are led astray. And so I want you to know, friends, God has a remnant church, a true Sabbath-keeping church. The second identifying um, uh, mark of this church, in, according to Revelation chapter 12, it says here, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So not only will they keep all of God's Ten Commandments, but they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, you might ask the question, Brian, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, Revelation tells us here, in Revelation 19 verse 10, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So you're looking for a church, friends, that believes in the spirit of prophecy. Well, all the prophets who wrote the Bible, that's the spirit of prophecy, but there's a church who will also have a modern day true prophet. And we're going to study that in another um, presentation, the spirit of prophecy. God's last day church will have prophecy that will point people in these last days and warn people in these last days of the corrupting influences in the world and lead men and women to the word of God and to Jesus Christ. So you're looking for a church that believes in the spirit of prophecy and has the gift of prophecy. You're looking for a worldwide church of believers that go to the all, co all four corners, all the four winds of the earth that are, have a mission to save people, that have a desire to lead people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and His saving grace. A worldwide church that is looking at bringing up people in their homes to discover what is true happiness. And so it will have a ministry for family life. It will have a ministry to educate young people what is true and what is right. And so you're looking for a church, friends that has a desire to share God's truth in the health message. A church that will warn people about the judgment and what is to take place. A church that makes disciples of all nations. A church that, was, that does not just set itself up against people. A church that treats all people and all nations and all color and all races the same. A church that has the commandments of Jesus that goes forth to teach people all things, as Jesus said, that I have commanded you. In fact, in Matthew 28, verses 20, God says, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. And so in the book of Revelation 14, we find there's a message that God gives to the Christian church, to the world, through the Christian church. It's the message of the three angels. We find this in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6. For John, as he looks at these three angels, which are not literal angels, but angels, friends, the book, the Bible, when it speaks of angels, was written in the book of Greek. And the word angel, which is angelos, means messenger. So you're looking for a, a, a church that has a message and its messengers go to the entire world. John says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. So this church uh, believes in the gospel of Jesus and it says uh, to preach unto the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. And so you're looking for a church that preaches on the judgment hour. When did this judgment hour take place? Well, October 22, 1844. That is when the judgment began in the heavenly sanctuary. Looking for a church that preaches loudly, clearly for all nations to understand the hour of God's judgment. How does God's judgment convene? It convenes in heaven. And what is the basis or the standard of God's judgment? God's Ten Commandment law. And so they have the faith of Jesus and they keep the commandments of Jesus. And of course, friends, we find that Jesus is the advocate. He's the one that stands for us in the judgment hour. You're looking for a church that points men and women to Jesus and to Jesus alone. Not to a man, not to a bishop, not to a pope, not to anybody else. But friends, 
to Jesus Christ. A church that will tell people about the fact that God created this earth in six literal days and then he blessed the seventh day. Why? Because he is the creator. And so he gave them the Sabbath and says, who worship, worship him who made heaven, the earth and the springs of waters. And so friends, you're looking for such a church. But there is a third, a second, a third angel. It says, and another angel followed them saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so we find that this church will expose Babylon's false teachings, her abominations, her changing of God's law, her false priests who claim to have power to forgive sins, the changing of God's truths about baptism, changing of God's truths about what happens when a person dies. You look for a church that will expose these, not to condemn but friends to point people to God's truth God loves everyone whether you are a Hindu a Muslim a Christian whether you're a Roman Catholic whether you're a Baptist a Methodist a Seventh-day Adventist God loves you and God sends you truth to save you friends and so a third angel follows them saying with a loud voice all three angels have a loud voice uh, the word megaphone or megaphony to uh, let the world know the truth of God's word. This is a warning to those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark on their forehead or on the hand. God says the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God's judgment. And so yes, this power, this church, this movement will speak God's truths and even reveal that a power will introduce the mark of the beast, which is in opposition to God's sign and God's seal, his true Sabbath. And so it's a false day of worship. So John 10 verse 16 says, as I wind up, and other sheep of I which are not of the fold, them also I must bring, Jesus says, and that they will hear my voice and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. And so friends, Jesus said that he has other sheep not everybody is in this one fold yet. That's why the three angels' messages must be preached with a loud voice so people will hear about the truths of God's word and people will come out of the false superstitions, ab abominations of Babylon. And so God says, come out of her, my people. Notice here in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you share not of her sins unless you receive of her plagues. Why? Because her sins have reached unto God and God, God has remembered a sin. So God is calling people out of apostasy into his true keeping church. Out of error into God's true church. Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. This is the conclusion of the three angels' messages. If you want to find the true church, here's it in this one text. Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And soon after the three angels' messages are preached and the judgment is over, John says in verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and his hand a sharp sickle. And so very quickly, friend, God's last day church, God's remnant church is to appear after the period of 1798. They will preach the three angels' messages. They will have the faith of Jesus which leads them to keep all of God's commandments. Number three, they will proclaim the special message of revelation to all the world to prepare people for God's soon return. They will have the gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of prophecy. And friends, if you will look at it, all churches at a glance look like it. But as you study God's word, you discover who are the remnant and you now measure up a church by God's word. You don't find a church and then measure the word to the church. No, friends, you take God's word and you measure God's church by that. So perhaps you are searching, perhaps you haven't found this true church and today you've heard some truths that you have not understood before. We've studied some remarkable prophecies and friends, clearly we can see God has a last day church, a remnant. Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Do you believe, friends, in God's word? Do you believe God as a people these days who have all the truths of the Bible that keep all ten commandments? And they have the gift of prophecy. Yes, there is such a church. Friends, I did not join the Seventh-day Adventist church because it was a family uh, thing. I did not join the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm a member of that church because I believe it is God's remnant church that keep all of His commandments and have the gift of prophecy. And I wonder if you would like to say, well, I would like to be part 
of God's last day church. Is that your desire, friends? If that's your desire, I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the study today. The book of Revelation leads us to the remnant church, your true church in these last days. Satan is angry, upset. He's mad with those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Those who have the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. And I thank you that you have a movement, a remnant church today that is proclaiming the three angels' messages throughout the entire world. Many, many are coming into this fold. And you have your people in so many different churches. And you send truth to save them, never to embarrass them, never ever to denounce or condemn. Thank you for being such a loving God. Bless each viewer. May they make a decision based on the truths in your word to follow Jesus and to be faithful to him and to all of his commandments and to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the gift of prophecy. In Jesus' name, amen.